Hello chemists! This is Ms. Placino and you are watching a lab tutorial video for lab number 6, the analysis of bleach. During this lab we're going to be running a bunch of titrations, uh, so let's start just by reviewing the equipment you're going to need. Over in your lab man manual for question 1, you've got two pieces of glassware. Uh, the one that's labeled number 1 is that long skinny tube. Uh, hopefully you recognize this as the burette. We use burettes because they allow us to measure and deliver extremely precise and accurate volumes of solution. Um, and that's a big part of this lab, is being able to know exactly how much solution was added. Uh, the liquid that goes inside the uh, burette, um, or specifically the solution that goes inside the burette, is called the titrant. And for our lab, the titrant is going to be the same for all of the titrations we run. It's going to be sodium thiosulfate, which is Na2S2O3. And of course, that will be aqueous. The other part of this setup is going to be a really familiar piece of glassware below that. Hopefully by now you are well aware that this piece of glassware is called an Erlenmeyer flask. Uh, we use an Erlenmeyer flask because it prevents splattering. Um, so if you're able to like swirl around the solution and hopefully none of it spills out, uh, we'll be using the stir bar so you're not going to have to do excessive amounts of swirling. Um, but it just it avoids splattering and that's why we always use this type of glassware for a titration. Uh, the solution that goes into the Erlenmeyer flask is called the analyte. You can think of that because we're trying to analyze what's in that solution. Uh, we'll be doing two different sets of titrations with two different analytes. Uh, the first, our standardization titration, we'll be using KiO3, which is aqueous, uh, that's potassium iodate. And um, during our uh, unknown titration, uh, your analyte is going to be a diluted bleach sample. We're going to be analyzing the sodium hypochlorite in that sample, the NaClO. Um, so we'll get that set up and ready to go. These are fairly involved titrations. You've got a whole lot of materials that are going to have to go into that Erlenmeyer flask before you can perform a titration. Uh, so let's kind of just review that now. The first thing we're going to put in is potassium iodide. Ki is just a white solid. You need to measure out approximately one gram. It is not essential that Ki is measured super carefully. Ballpark a gram anywhere from like 0.85 to 1.15 is totally adequate. Uh, we're not using the mass of potassium iodide for any calculations. It's simply providing I minus iodide ions uh, for the reaction. You're also going to add sulfuric acid. Uh, for the standardization titrations, you need five milliliters of one molar. Again, this also does not need to be carefully measured. It needs to be roughly five milliliters. There is no benefit in agonizing over getting exactly five milliliters. Anywhere from four to six is going to be totally fine. Now this reaction takes place in an acidic medium. So really the H2SO4 is just providing an excess of H plus ions for the reaction. Uh, starch is also used. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. That's an indicator. It is not measured carefully. And we'll get that swirled up a little bit to help things dissolve. The titrant, sodium thiosulfate, does get measured carefully. Uh, that's exactly why we're using the burette. So that does need to be measured extremely carefully. Um, we also have our KiO3 solution. You need to measure out 10 milliliters of that. So of course the best tool for the job is the volumetric pipette. Uh, make sure that you've rinsed the pipette with water twice to wash it, and then with your solution once to make sure the inside walls are completely coated with the solution. Uh, this has already been prepped, so we're going to go ahead and use it. Almost there. Pretty close. And let it drain. Uh, remember, you do not want to shake out the last drop of liquid inside the pipette. You can see as we're adding this solution that the color has changed. It's kind of this like reddish brown rusty color. That's what it should look like. Uh, that's the iodide ions in solution. Well, the I2 that gets formed. We had to measure our analyte carefully. Again, that's the KiO3. Um, when we go to analyze the bleach sample, we will also have to measure the sodium chlorate very carefully. Um, it's really those three substances that we're going to use for calculations. Uh, the volume and molarity of the sodium thiosulfate, um, the quantity of KiO3 that is used, um, and the amount of bleach that was used. 
Last but not least, we add in some tap water just to kind of provide more volume uh, for the solution to take place in. We do not need to measure that carefully. And give it a swirl, make sure that it's well mixed. Uh, but of course, you're gonna just use the stir bar feature and get it stirring. Nice. Okay, before we get into the titration itself, uh, let's just talk a little bit about using your burette correctly. So I'm over on question four. Um, hopefully you remember how to read a burette from 10th grade. Uh, take a look at those two practice problems, the volume initial and volume final over the course of a titration. Pay a special, uh, especially careful attention to significant figures. Um, each of those tick marks represents one tenth of a milliliter. So what place should you be measuring to? Hopefully you're thinking the hundredths place. Uh, so pause the video, take a second, and come up with your vinyl, uh, volume initial and volume final. And the example we've got, I measured an initial volume of about 0 0.75 milliliters and a volume final of 14.26 milliliters. As long as you've got it out to the hundredths place, you're fine. You don't have to agree 100%. We know the uncertainty is in the last digit. So to take care of those bullet points, when using a burette, use the unit milliliter. Uh, as a reminder, read from the bottom of the meniscus and you wanna be at eye level. Um, for some of you, that means you're gonna have to like bring the burette down so that you can see it at eye level, especially when it's close to being full. Uh, each tick mark is a 10th of a milliliter. So all of your measurements should be estimated out to the 100th place. Uh, you know I'm gonna be looking for that when uh, you turn in your data pages. To find the volume total, you just take the final volume and you subtract the initial volume. Be careful with significant figures, and you should have two places after the decimal point. So once the burette is properly cleaned, and that really just, it's the same way as you clean your uh, pipette. Rinse it twice with water, once with solution. Fill the burette with the titrant, I'm going on here, um, and before you start, uh, as you're filling a burette, you usually trap some air bubbles in there. That's really normal, and you don't want those in there because they take up space without occupying, uh, without the solution occupying any of that volume. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and drain the pipette, let some of those air bubbles escape. You should be able to see them. I want to just tap the, uh, the, the spigot a little bit, try to get them out of there. And now you know that any volume that's being occupied inside the burette is with the solution that you're using to titrate with, AKA your titrant. Okay, uh, let's backtrack to question number three. We got those four pictures of Erlenmeyer flasks. And that first Erlenmeyer flask, what color do you see? And we've got this reddish brown, so I'd write that in the, volume, uh, the Erlenmeyer flask all the way to the left. When you set up the stir bar, you don't want it stirring so fast that it's splattering all over the place or so slowly that it's not really doing much of anything. You want to kind of find that happy in between and that number is going to be a little bit different on everybody's uh, stir bar. Over that first arrow, write S2032-. That is the ion that we are adding um, that's going to uh, be involved in the reaction. The sodium ion is a spectator. You can see as the titrant is added to the analyte, we're seeing a gradual change in color. That reddish brown color is disappearing, and it's more of a yellow color. You want to keep adding the titrant until you get to a pale yellow. So in that second Erlenmeyer flask, right, yellow. Ultimately, this is going to turn clear. It is very, very difficult for most people to detect the color change from extremely pale yellow to clear. Here's where our indicator, starch, comes in. Go ahead and just get a dropper full of starch, and you're going to add the entire dropper full. So over that second arrow, write starch, and needless to say, the resulting color is black. We're still looking for that color change to clear, but hopefully now that the solution is black, it's gonna be easier to see that change. Uh, so over that last arrow, write S2032 minus as we continue to titrate to our clear endpoint. And you wanna be really careful when you get to this point. It is very easy to overshoot or just over titrate. So be patient, add a little, let the stir bar do the work. You might end up having to pick up your Erlenmeyer flask and give it a little bit of a swirl. 
Nothing wrong with doing that. And once you're confident that it's done, and right now it is, it's not going to get any more clear than that, you're finished with the titration. Uh, you will record the final volume, hopefully you record the initial. And these are really low concentrations, pretty innocuous stuff, so it can just go down the drain. Oops, drop the stir bar. And that's it. You're going to repeat that titration, hopefully, no more than six times. We run titrations in triplicate. Um, that is the best way to ensure that at least our data is precise. Uh, so we'll talk more about this in class next week. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you found this helpful.